Hello, viewers. My name is Chris Pullnagel, and I'm the director of the Congregational Vitality Initiative at the Vancouver School of Theology, which is situated in British Columbia in Canada. Today, I have with me in our virtual studio, of course, some key leaders who are involved in shaping the nature and content of Christian education in the mainline church in Canada and overseas too. The purpose of today's conversation is to mine some of their wisdom and insights about the future of uh, Christian education and its relevance to the health and vitality of the church as it lives through this special time in our lives uh, and of course the pandemic. So I'm going to thank you by, uh, I'm going to start by thanking you dear gentlemen for your time and then invite you to introduce yourselves, although uh, you are probably well known already. Then we'll dive into our conversation and I'll do that by asking you some questions and see where that leads us, if that's okay. So uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Let's start from uh, east to west. And so Rob, start with you. Thanks, Chris. My name is Rob Fennell. And I teach historical and systematic theology at Atlantic School of Theology, which is in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And I'm also currently the academic dean of that school. Thank you. John. I'm John Young. Um, I'm currently the executive minister for theological leadership in the United Church's General Council Office. Um, and in my past, I've served in congregational ministry. And also I taught... Um, primarily in the fields of church history and practical studies at Queens for um, 25 years. And you're, you are looking forward to? <laughs> Sorry. Um, and starting the, I'm, I had planned to retire the end of July uh, and I'm leaving my current position. Uh, that was the plan. And that's, but um, mid-August, I'm going to uh, be the interim principal at Emmanuel College from mid-August of 2021 till the end of June, 2022. Thanks, John. Ray. My name is Ray Aldred. I'm the Director of Indigenous Studies at the Vancouver School of Theology, and I am the interim dean here until July 1. Oh, of this year. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. So I'm going to dive right into questions. And uh, the first one I'm going to ask you, and we have no particular order of answering, just jump in as you feel led to. So in your opinion, uh, how has the pandemic especially changed or not changed the nature, which is content delivery focus, et cetera, of Christian education as you see from your vantage point? Well, you know, Christian education is a pretty big catch-all phrase. So we can think about uh, faith formation for children, for youth, for adults, for formal studies. Um, a lot of us, well, all of us here are connected with um, uh, the education of persons who are preparing for ministry as well as, as uh, mature adults. And um, I mean, the most obvious thing, first of all, is that uh, most of that work, all of that work has been really constricted by what can happen in person. So quite a bit of um, Christian education for children and youth has has uh, really suffered in the sense of not being able to happen in a many, in many places. Some folks have tried the online connections with varying degrees of success. And um, in our local context where I worship, we've taken a lot of that outside. We can do forest church and things like that uh, where we are. Um, for adults uh, and in a complementary way for seminary students, um, almost all of it has had to move to online contexts using this uh, new platform, new to many of us anyway, Zoom and uh, comparable things. And again, varying degrees of success for those who are well connected and familiar and confident with online communications, that's turned out to be quite effective and quite good. And for others, it's been a real struggle or they have felt left out by it. So it's a, it's a real mixed bag, I think. And we mm. don't know how it's going to end because it hasn't ended yet. Right. right. Here, just in some ways to build on, on Rob's comments, um, and I would agree with 
with what he's with his analysis. The one thing that I've that I'm aware of is that um, I, there's I think the pandemic has brought about more um, adult um, study whether that's Bible study or whether it's study a particular area of theology, whether it's study um, what reconciliation might look like for us in the present time. Um, but I would say that what I'm going to call adult Christian education, I'm here, I'm not talking about what we would do in theological school with people preparing for ministry, but adult Christian education, whether that's faith formation, whether that's on in, in the kind of the seeker sense or whether it's ongoing, um, is not something that I think we've as a denomination have been good at. Um, but I'm just aware, and I, I don't think it's just anecdotally, but I, that's that maybe it may just be more localized, but there's more of that happening now than there was. And, you know, it could be because people are at home and they're really anxious to connect with other people. Um, or it may be that, that in the present time, folks um, offering leadership in, in our congregations have, have, you know, they've been very creative around worship. And I've also thought maybe this is a time when we can do more. And um, so I think there's more happening there. And I'm also aware of different congregations getting together. So it's not just congregation A is doing it, but there's more, in fact, joint work happening in that area. And mm. that's, I mean, that's apart from what something like the United in Learning uh, has has been offering. They've had increased attendance at events they've done as well. So, so that's a, that's a really, um, pandemic has lots of negative sides, but it's also um, provoked some creativity and there are some, um, some silver linings to see here too, I think. Hmm. Thanks, John. Any additional comments, Ray? If you have any? Um, since we already did a hybrid program where different individuals from different, sometimes different countries, so we have students in Hawaii and mm -hmm. uh, some of them are already doing uh, synchronous learning through uh you know zoom since we were already using it in in many of our classes already so then the pandemic just pushed everybody into those hmm. categories uh i wonder if uh our our enrollment as a school went up so i concur that some there was more uh more people were thinking of doing study uh, I mm. wonder if that's sort of run its course now because people are tired. They have Zoom lash and right. Zoom lag. And, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so, but we know from online education that about uh, when it comes to professors, only about 10% of your professors, at least this was about the whole, probably five, six years ago in a study, only five, only about 10% of professors at a theological institution can actually make the switch to do true online learning. Really, And, and that's pushed some of us. So we still don't do, we do remote delivery, but we don't do online learning. So some folks try to do some online learning and, uh, and uh, so maybe that moved it a little further down the, down the path. We also discovered that, uh, man, you don't need to travel as much. Some of the things mm. I do, I could probably continue to do on Zoom. I mean, I used to travel a lot sometimes. Uh, I remember one year I did 100 flights. So, you know, so that's 50, but 100 when you add up both ways. And, and then uh, some of them you probably could just do. I got a chance to preach in uh, Charlottesville, uh, in Virginia. I mm. preached in a variety of different places, you know, through Zoom and but at the same time, it's it's not quite the same because I think courses that are mostly content do well, but I'm not sure how well courses that require more interaction mm -hmm. as a class. I mean, you try to do those things. You, you definitely can't online. You can't cover as much material as you could, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you just you just can't if, if you're going to actually allow interaction. So. So then also, so when you do online learning, if you use like, uh, you know, uh, a blog style sort of forum for students, 
you only get about half your students who actually sort of engage Engaged. those kinds of things. So, you know, I don't know. Man, it'll, I guess it'll come to pass. Also, we noticed that a lot of, lot more students, I think people were struggling with their mental state at times mm. that prevented them from mm. uh, studying. And I can understand that. I think I suffered. I know I languish at times just trying to figure, it's trying to stay motivated, you know, wondering if it's ever going to be over. So <laughs> anyways, I'm going on mostly negative, but. No, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I oh. think the word language is going to be uh, one of the key terms that <laughs> describes this whole period we are through. Rob, you mentioned. So one thing I did, one thing I did do is I, I did a, I, I just, I just did more online, an actual online course. I sort of had a course that I ran oh. remotely, but then I also had an online, you could do it completely online, asynchronously. So then. Uh, yeah. Uh, and Rob, you mentioned um, changes in deliveries methods, right? What about content? You think teaching content, I mean, I'm referring now specifically to the stuff that seminaries teach as a, as a part of the Christian education, you know, spectrum. Do you think content will change? I do. Oh. Um, I do. Although, um, you know, there is a notorious lag in theology. Theology is always the last to adapt to any cultural moment. Art is first, theology is last. And right. uh, so there's a bit of a lag. And for example, in the coming year, you know, we're looking at courses that um, frame some of the work of ministry, quote unquote, in the digital age. I mean, that's mm. kind of a catch all phrase for the kind of moment we're living in. And of course, the digital age has been around for a while, but how do you do pastoral care, for example, when it isn't only, or you can't at all, knock on someone's door and come by for a cup of tea? Right. Um, what, what are the dynamics of preparing and delivering a worship service? when you can't gather with your congregation in the worship space that you used to be in together, or your musicians are sequestered or, or mm. quarantined. So the, the work of preparing persons to think about how that practical work of ministry happens has to change and incorporate these new dynamics, even if, as we all hope this pandemic ends, even so we have to think about how those, those, uh, mechanisms and skills and practices are are adapting over over these years but the other thing you know is the the multiple over over layers of other cultural dynamics that are happening that are impacting other fields um, uh, the subdiscipline of practical theology that i've been describing obviously interrelates with things like systematic theology mm -hmm. or biblical studies um, how do those things also respond to climate change? How do we respond to mm -hmm. the changing um, understanding of human creature in relation to the creation in which we have been placed? And that that work is ongoing, as it is in every generation, but the lag and the theological development that has to come with that um, will be a few years in catching up. Not to say it's not important enough to be tomorrow, it's just that uh, scholarship, does, scholarship doesn't change overnight. It, right. it has to adjust, adjust and adapt, and also learn from other disciplines. So I think it's it's underway. That content change is underway, um, and it's a it's a it's a progressive um, evolutionary kind of process as we mm -hmm. adjust to this disruption. So the the content of the material doesn't disruptively change overnight. It's an adaptation even though there has been this cultural disruption. That's a bit of a roundabout response. No, no, I like that. Yeah. yeah. I like the fact that you said that theology always lags behind. Art oh, first. Oh, always. <laughs> That's so true. I'm going to quote that some, at some point of time always. somewhere. <laughs> always. And <laughs> theologians have to acknowledge that limitation. <laughs> I, I think it applies to the church overall. Uh, for me to know who's in the neighborhood, I'd rather walk into a place like Loblaws and see what's on the shelf uh, than look, go to a church and see who's attending, right? Because 
we are about 10, 15 years behind all the time. Hmm. Well, but even um, just thinking about, uh, I, I Robert, really appreciated that reflection because it's true. Um, and, and I mean, part of the challenge it always is, I mean, so if you're leading worship and your endeavor, I mean, we have scripture and certainly my understanding is that that it, it speaks afresh to every generation. I mean, it, um, it, the writings may be ancient, but that whole sense of this being a living word, because in fact, it, we, we've been able to, to um, have reflection on it that speaks to the times in which we live. But as you say, the, that kind of further reflection theologically of what do these events mean? I mean, it always has to happen after the event. So there's, um, there's a certain inevitableness to that. Yeah. And, and, and this is where a field like the history of Christianity or church history, as it's sometimes called, is so yeah. valuable because we understand over the millennia of Christi Christianity, the Christ Christian history, that uh, disruption and adaptation is not new. No, um, it's not new. The dissolution of the monasteries under Henry VIII was a mm. radical disruption in civil society, yeah. and the church had to adapt. Yeah. So it's not new that it changes. So the question becomes, what what do we affirm as stable? What needs to be in continuity, even if yeah. forms and modes change over mm. the centuries and the decades? Yeah. We're, we're just a little microscopic moment in history mm. right now. Uh, right. But there's a, a much broader history in which we fit, and it's indeed much longer than than the two thousand years we think about for Christianity. Wasn't it Phyllis Tickle who said in one of her books, the five hundred year kind of uh, mm. uh, uh, something like yeah. that, and we are in that season now. <laughs> Maybe that's prophetic. A, that's a know. thing. That's a thing. Not everyone agrees with it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would. Yeah, I, <laughs> there are there there are aspects of it, but no, I. Um, yeah, I, I, I would. That's that's another subject. Yes, for another, <laughs> another day. hour of discussion. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say too. I mean, the other thing that 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 history reminds us of is that um, we're we're not the first to live in challenging times, right. and in fact, um, one of the things that I did fairly early in the pandemic was to go back and just look again at something Martin Luther wrote about uh, he, one of his pastors was wrestling with, is it okay for me to, um, is it okay for me to leave the city where I am if, if it's undergoing a plague? I mean, I'm offering a rough translation. It was just really interesting to kind of look at how Luther wrestled through that pastorally. And so th there's also those, those kinds of examples that, um, that I, that I think are helpful. Um, I'll just say, and in some ways, building off the, your initial question a bit of a different way, I think one of the other things that um, the pandemic, pandemic has brought, and I'm still certainly for myself <clears throat> trying to wrestle through what this might mean. On the one hand, uh, it's opened us up to a technology, for instance, around worship, mm. around Christian education, that makes it possible for persons who are, are shut-ins um, mm -hmm. who might have maybe at one time were active in a church, but aren't now, but also people who may live more remotely, um, the, whether it was the United Church or the Lutheran Church or whatever in their community closed a while ago, um, access to a worship community is not easy. And suddenly the pandemic has made it possible for them to participate in a sense of community. So that's, that's, so what happens when it's over? <laughs> and so on the one hand, do we want to, how do we sort of resume what we used to do, but also maintain something that's enabled us to reach a lot of other folks? I mean, and I think that's true of worship, but I think it's true of around Christian education more narrowly. I think another challenge is, um, as Rob said, there are other cultural things happening about. So um, the practice of any formal religious tradition these days in Canadian context is far, far less than it was a generation ago, not to mention two. I mean, people talk about the decline of the mainline churches, but just, I mean, whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Christian of whatever variety, um, but it's, if, you're a, if you're an active member of a faith tradition, you're in a distinct minority. So mm -hmm. what does it, What's it mean for, in this case, I'll think of my own denomination, the United Church of Canada. We have a number of small congregations. Um, I'm thinking here of the ones that tend to be a distance from 
from another one. What's it mean for, for how, as a denomination, we try to provide ministerial service in those situations? What, so, I mean, do we, um, we've had a practice of trying to say, you know, every, every congregation has a minister. Well, um, we have a lot that don't right now um, yeah. and that are geographically distant. So what kinds of models do we need to look at for the future in terms of simply providing ministerial service in places where right now it's, um, it's existing only because, not that this is a bad thing, it's existing uh, in the sense of local lay people are gathering, but there's nobody we would quote call a minister, unquote, um, attending to that. So again, history has some models. Um, technology offers us some new possibilities. I think that's something with which we need to be very much wrestling in the present time. Mm. So, Thanks. Really, comments on that? John, I like what you said about uh, people who can go to church now. The church can actually come to them, right, via technology. And that's a huge, I'm thinking of my uh, dear mother who yeah. is not living anymore, but yeah. the time that she was sick and she would love to go be in church, uh, she would have had uh, a screen and she could have been part of church. Yeah. I mean, uh, I had, what was interesting for me about, you know, six weeks into the pandemic, conversations with several former students of mine who were recounting <laughs> conversations with members of their congregations who, again, had not been physically able to go to church for like five or 10 years. Suddenly they're part of it and they're saying, geez, this is really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And most of us are struggling with <laughs> the fact we can't do all these things we're used to doing, like gathering other people in worship. And yet we had another, another segment mm -hmm. of, um, of the body who were able to be part of it in a way they hadn't for, for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And again, as I said, so what's that going to look like going forward right. when, okay, the congregation I, I attend, we're back in worship. What about those people? Mm -hmm. How do, how do we continue that? Two things we're doing. Two things that happened because of this pandemic and then one will continue on. And they were all premised, they were all sort of started already. One in Indigenous studies shifting prior to the pandemic. So then it sort of was led into being able to think a little, a little differently about theological education. One is that uh, most uh, theological institutions and, and seminaries think primarily about the capacity of an individual. So then you focus on individuals and training them. We had shifted a few years back to think about communities. Mm -hmm. So then you're thinking about because indigenous communities and we were focused mostly on indigenous communities. Now there's still a need to shift about urban a little bit, but thinking what, what does the community, how do we build capacity in the community to meet what they perceive as their needs for, for Indigenous education uh, because some historical things that happened in the Anglican Church, for example, when they determined that the Eucharist had to be celebrated every, every week, that meant the priest had to visit weekly, which, which put a greater financial burden on the communities, and it also displaced lay readers who had carried on the ministry and catechists who carried on. So that was like that when that happened. So then what we were doing, we started with the teaching house that moves around is where you focused on helping build capacity in a team of people in a different, different communities. So then when the pandemic happened, we started using Zoom to teach what people felt were things that uh, what John has said, sort of what people needed and there was no one to do it. So how do you do a graveside? How do you do visitation? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you pray for people who are going through specific things, usually related to grieving and dying because there was a lot of people that were passing on. And then a lot of leaders now have passed on, many because of COVID, but some just because they were older so going forward what we're going to do is rethink about how exactly you do ordination the eastern orthodox church in the arctic 
years ago, when they trained ministers, you would sort of, uh, now I'm, I'm riffing off of Mark McDonald. So what you would do is you'd go and you do two, three days of training. And after that time, then you were commissioned to do these tasks mm. in, in the community, wherever you were. And then you'd come back and you'd do some more training. And then that time you'd be ordained a deacon. And then you'd continue in that for a time, but then doing these episodic trainings. And then you would each time until not, not everyone becomes a priest, but this was, this was the thinking. So then we're trying to think in those terms. And so then this, the role of the institution, the school is not only to impart content to individual but also help the community develop Mm. with the lay reader a sacred circle of support where they're at so then that goes back to when i used to do leadership development in both in a denomination christian missionary alliance and then in sort of with a organization of nine people international where you you go into communities and you and you help people think about what what are the resources that are actually already available mm-hmm. and how can we build better systems to make those things function a little more effectively together this doesn't require a huge input from outside but at the same time the the voice from outside sometimes can see things just slightly different which you know, you're bouncing that perspective off people who are there and help sort of through guided conversation to see how some of these things might work a little more effectively. So, oh, Ray, uh, you, you uh, prompted something in my mind. I am connected with, dotted line connection with the Ministry, ministry of Rural Network. It's the Rural Network Ministry. And <laughs> they are talking the same kind of concept that you just described where uh, training becomes localized in a, in a community setting where congregations that don't have full-time ministers are now relying more and more on their lay, lay folk and through uh, using tools like appreciative inquiry and so on, being to see what, what do we have in the community that can be used for. So d- is that is that something that is that a direction that some seminaries might be moving into, kind of having these uh, mobile, virtual, off uh, campus kind of learning and training institutions? Yeah, capacity becomes an issue, right? Mm. Like, like any any given theological school in Canada has you know, X volume of resources, human resources and money resources and so on. Mm -hmm. And the notion of modular community-based education for ministry, training for ministry really works in some places and is needed in some places. And I know that in in some cases it's been um, sort of a school set up by a bishop who has Mm -hmm. made that happen. And there's a certain amount of interest or pressure on, you know, good pressure on a theological school to develop something like that. And in some cases, that's possible as an adjunct to what's already happening. Um, I haven't seen the Canadian theological school go completely over into that mod- mm-hmm. modality as a, as a full-on project. Um, but to add it to what we more conventionally do is stretching that that resources which remains at x Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's not x plus it never it doesn't become x plus unless somebody leaves us 10 million dollars but that doesn't happen that's not enough right (laughs) yeah so so then so then there and and i don't want to be too um you know unnecessarily territorial (laughs) but if it's exclusively modular field-based learning is that a sustainable model for a theological school to carry on in the long term? Or does the theological school become so decentered that it actually dissolves? And, and I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Um, 
the notion that it's an adjunct or an add-on to what already happens, mm. that's, that's a good idea. And there's a stretch on resources. If it's a full-on conversion or transformation into that other kind of modality of training, can the theological school sustain that over the mm. long term without dissolving itself? And my fear, to be quite honest, if that dissolution happens, is that there is then no collegium of instructors who can carry it out, uh, at least in terms of being a scholarly enterprise. It's possible, as it, as it was long before there were theological schools or universities at all, it is possible to deliver that kind of education. Um, but it's, it's almost flipping back 800 or 1,000 years to a different kind of modality that doesn't include the dynamic of a thing or the reality of a thing called a theological school, I think it would, I think it would, it would dissolve. And mm. maybe that's where we're headed. Uh, maybe <laughs> I would lament that. I would grieve mm -hmm. that. But uh, if that's where, if that's what happens, that may just be the tide of history flowing over us. But I do have some mm. misgivings about that. Mm. I would agree if it was an either or sort of thing, but I don't envision it that way. But the shifts that, the, sh the, the things that make it either or is if you continue to focus on individuals, that's not, that's not what I'm thinking. I'm thinking in terms of indigenous communal identity. So then what, what you need to happen is there needs to be greater work done to actually help the community see how they have a part in the mission of the school. Because Schools do well when whole communities or churches send a whole bunch of in the 2000s, there were churches sending all kinds of people to schools. Well, actually, back in 19, 1998, 1988, yeah, 1988, in the 80s, there was churches were sending all kinds of people to to school because they saw the school as part of their their mandate i just what i'm trying to do is build on things that work well in the past so that's kind of i have no i agree with you i have no desire to see the the seminary become completely module what i am though is helping broaden the base not everybody needs to get an mdiv not everybody needs to go to seminary but right right but as you as you work with people in community then some of those realize gee i'd like i'm good at this and maybe the community says hey yeah you should go study i think this would add to the number of people being good people being trained as they get a taste of theological education also because we have a non-resident program for the Indigenous Studies program, when communities experience some of the same training that students, our students have been training, so then I build that into these, these modulars that upper senior students are part of this training process, so then mm. they, they teach and they learn to teach a little more effectively, also include some local practitioners then again, it builds on things that are already happening in the community. It just brings them sort of together. And then you end up with more students at your seminary because these people are identified. That's kind of, because I've thought through, because I have seen some schools try to go totally modular and it, you're right, it just dissolves. And also what happens is you end up with all adjuncts, professors and you don't have any you know, senior scholars who can actually do it for a living, which is a big problem. So. Yeah. Hmm. It's, it's almost like we are talking about uh, a tale of two churches, urban and rural. And in the rural context, which is getting pushed even further uh, far, this whole concept of lay leadership and developing what's there is becoming more prominent. So. So maybe one of the future things might be that seminaries look at uh, as just as much church is going to be hybrid. Education also might be hybrid. I don't know. Just to switch conversations a little bit or topics rather. Uh, what message 
would you as uh, leaders in education, CE, uh, send to congregations in our present context as they strive to just stay alive, grow, thrive, or languishing in whatever word you want to use? Uh, you know, what, what encouragement or what words would you use to, uh, yeah, what would you say at this time? I say, look at you as leaders of um, institutions that train ministers to, to work in these areas, in these congregations. Well, you know, I would, I would want to say that survival is not a virtue for this, if, if it's survival for the sake of survival. Uh, that's, that's not a virtue. Mm. Survival for the sake of mission or for the sake of service, that, that's a virtue. So in the pandemic, surviving is a good thing. But we don't survive only to survive. We survive in order to thrive into God's purposes. And God's purposes have to do with serving the world around us, loving the world around us, fulfilling those things that the church is meant to do, um, uh, tapping again into the reasons that God has called the church to exist at all. And if that's where our energy lies, I think we're doing what we're meant to do. Size isn't that particularly important to question. Um, survival for its own sake is misguided. But if we're orienting our lives and our, our communities toward those purposes for which God has called the church into being, then we're fulfilling our purpose. And it takes, it takes some reorienting, you know, mm. uh, there's a, a bit of a, a thread through some of the mainline churches um, where we have become glorified fundraising societies. <laughs> and that in itself is not yeah. virtuous. Right. But if it's about handing on the faith, if it's about serving our neighbors, if it's about caring for creation, if it's about advancing the gospel, that's closer to what I think the local church is meant to be about. And it's it's hard to get our heads around that sometimes when we are so infected, I use that word advisedly, by the surrounding cultural voice mm. of, of capitalism, mm -hmm. which doesn't help us think in those terms. Because at the end of the day, the church is about self-extension and self-giving if it is Christoform, if it is formed in the image of Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus is not particularly interested in whether we are balance sheet is in the black. <laughs> yes. Jesus is interested in, are we serving and loving our neighbors? Wow, so many servant themes in this, in this, in this few minutes. <laughs> Anybody else want to riff off that? <laughs> um, two things. Um, and really this, this does build on, on Rob's point. Um, this, by way of a quick, I'll try and make it a quick story. Um, when I was teaching a, one of the students um, serving, in this case, two small rural churches, um, uh, in this case in northern New York, anyway, with one of them, um, she had, this is a worshiping congregation of like kind of 25 people on a Sunday, 20 to 25. Um, she was encouraged them along the very lines Rob was, was is just saying, like, what, you know, what's your, what's your mission in this place? And so they decided to, they, they pulled people in the community. What if, what would, what does this community most need that the church might be able to do? And they got a surprisingly good response from the survey they did, but they didn't, the thing they thought of the things they heard back, the top three, one of them was a thrift store and what was a very, a very poor community. Um, and so they did this a um, couple of afternoons, converted the church basement a couple of afternoons a week and the thing took off. And, and um, over time, within a year, somebody offered to, um, uh, a summer resident in the area offered to pay the rent for them to move to an abandoned storefront in the community. Um, what was interesting though, is that the church uh, went from 20 to 25 people to 35 to 50 in two years in terms of attendance. They had a Sunday school they didn't used to have. And I remember the student saying she was walking down the street one day and um, the guy who owned the diner came to the door and called her to come on in and he gave her money because he said, um, 
your church is really trying to do something in the community makes a difference. He wasn't a member of the church, but um, so what, what I liked about like what I find powerful about the story is again, it speaks to um, a church that's trying to serve. Now the flip the, the addition to that I want to make is that um, we live in a time when lots of people have no idea um, what happens in the local mosque or the local Anglican church or the local United church, um, what they're about. And I think we need in our Christian education to also give a lot more attention to kind of basic instruction. Um, we have seekers who, um, for whatever reason, might be led. So think about that story. Somebody who's led as a result of that to enter that church door. At the same time, we have to be prepared to help. And I think I would say to teach the faith tradition. Um, I grew up in a world that just assumed I would get that by mm -hmm. being <laughs> growing up in my rural community. I think it was a faulty assumption in the 1950s and 60s, but <laughs> we all know that it doesn't happen that way now. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the other thing I want to put with that. We need to be intentional about that. Um, and I agree with what Rob said about um, um, health of a congregation is not measured by um, the bank account. And my, my illustration notwithstanding, by just how many people come. I mean, obviously you want people to connect to that community, but um, growth for growth's sake is not um, is, is not what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Are any words of wisdom from your end? Otherwise, I have another question. Oh, no, you can, you can ask another question. I don't oh, okay. think I have much wisdom left. <laughs> it's enjoying the rest then. <laughs> uh, well, so in my position as, you know, directing this Congregational Vitality Initiative, uh, for me, Congregational Vitality must mean that the members of the congregation have to be vital and healthy. Because if the congregation, the members aren't healthy and vital, the congregation won't be. I think so far, for a long time, we as congregants have managed to hide our lack of health behind programs. And so the church is called into program, you get involved, you give your time and all of the stuff, but really be neglectful of other parts of your, your being, like your spiritual health and all of that. That's got exposed. So my, um, my mantra is, so the future of the church really depends, is in the hands of the lay people and, and the lay who are equipped, empowered and mobilized to be the church in the world. That's, that's kind of a short form for where my head is. So given that, first of all, do you guys agree with that kind of thinking? And if so, what should change in the way that we train our ministers who serve in these congregations for that culture to kind of start taking place. I'd love, love to hear some of your uh, responses to that. Because 98% um, of our church are lay. And uh, if we don't mobilize them, equip them first, and then give them and empower them and then mobilize them, if you don't do that, uh, we are going to be a church still confined to the four walls of a building and not being the church in the world, wherever God has put, put the church. <laughs> I didn't oh, want to stop I, you guys. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't disagree with you, Chris. And, and I mean, I guess I've tried in my own modest ways throughout my ministry career to do that kind of equipping and to encourage lay people also to equip each other. Mm -hmm. So, Together we learn to pray, and then we teach one more to pray. And mm -hmm. together we learn how to read the Bible, and then we teach one more how to read the Bible. And that's a bit of a, a dream, but you know that is the dream. No, that is it. Yeah. And and uh, that kind of discipling and then co-discipling is is yeah. very much the work of the whole church. It's a particularly Protestant Protestant perspective that you just outlined, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, um, and. You know, where it collapses is when we start to think of our churches as being led by professionals who are spiritual on our behalf. Right. So I become a spectator 
to the minister's exemplary spirituality, and I applaud it and I appreciate it, but it's not necessarily mine that I do. And you consume it, of course, but you don't, that's it. <laughs> and, and so the challenge becomes to say, this isn't me performing spirituality for you as your minister, but all of us together growing and developing in our awareness of the Holy Spirit throughout all of life. So when we leave this building and through the week, in our interactions in work and the way in which we raise our children, how we talk to our neighbors, all the things that we do are expressions of our spiritual life. And that's, that's again, a reorientation of the heart and the vision that takes time. And it's maybe the lifetime, a work of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I guess to the extent that ministers also have kind of bought into that professionalization that I, it's my job to perform spirituality we we actually disempower our people when we do mm -hmm. that. So it's 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 a challenge, and um, that challenge doesn't seem to be going away. But I think you're onto something for sure. Mm. Well, thank you. Just to build on on what Rob has said, and I would agree with him. Um, I think something we've we've done as a church, which is really unhelpful, is to uh, is to somehow suggest that the call to be um, the ordained or the commissioned minister is somehow a higher form of call. Um, in our tradition, uh, at its best, we, we, we would say that God calls each of us. Um, my uncle who farmed, uh, my aunt who farmed with him were called to that. Um, and that's a call just as significant and just as faithful and just as important as mine. Um, a lot of what we do in the church doesn't um, support support that understanding to the degree it should and um rob is right that that um i don't know that i don't it's not something that we've done intentionally but there is a sense in which we uh many people in the church see the minister as somehow uh living out a certain life vicariously and things spiritually here on their behalf and um it is something that we are um uh to which we are each called and so i think I'm speaking here in my own denomination, the United Church of Canada. I think we need to do quite a bit of work on what I would call the ministry of the lady. And I don't mean in this case, lay members leading worship. I mean, mm -hmm. the sense of mm -hmm. the ministry of the laity. So um, the whole concept that that as an, as an ordained minister in the United Church, in congregation of ministry or in other things, I'm about equipping the saints. I, I think that's equipping one of the things with worship, the other things we do is it seems to me we equip the saints, the members of the church to go out and live their ministry in the wider world. And that's neither less nor more, but it is different from what some of us who are called to exercise our ministries in and for the service of the church do. And um, theologically, um, I think we've... Uh, it's not that we've ever denied it, but that's that's uh, something that we've lost, and I think we desperately need to, or at least we've. It's become more minimal in our life, and we desperately need to recover it. I think. Mm -hmm. I, my whole philosophy with education is to, at least the last few years, is to. I talk with a community, and help them. My my role is just to come alongside and help them be better at mm. whatever they are trying to get at. And I guess I do the same thing with people who take classes. I think the, the shift that needs, I kind of like oh, James McClendon's stuff that we focus so much in seminaries on competence and in ministry on competence on being able to perform certain things and not, and not on developing character. So then I shifted talking with indigenous leaders. They wanted three things from theological education. They wanted help dealing with the trauma, the generational trauma because of abuse. They wanted help in their relationship with their spouse, their partner, for, for family kind of stuff, usually marriages, that's what they talked about. And the third thing is they wanted 
guidance in in uh, theological education, practical theological education, meaning how to do Bible study. Because most most folks don't. It, going to church every week is not an ideal for Indigenous people. They don't think that's mm -hmm. a value that needs to be, that never was something that, you know, a big thing. So then we tended to use the last few years, the gospel-based discipleship coming out of the Indigenous Anglican Church is something we tend to use. Theologically, though, when I think about curriculum, I think if we shifted, and, and most schools I think are doing this, you're trying to shift and re-engage to see how ministry and mission really flows out of the, the doctrine of creation. So then that way, repairing all, any of these relationships like John talked about. So then ministry reconciliation could start with reconciling with the land, reconciling mm -hmm. with others, reconciling with yourself mm -hmm. and reconciling uh, with, with the creator. And I used to think because I was part of a holiness denomination that that had to be the creator. That was most of the focus. So the church focuses mostly on that relationship, mm -hmm. which is probably good, I think, but <laughs> I, I was trying to give people permission to start at any of these relationships and they, if you're holistic, then they tend to all lead back into one another mm -hmm. for indigenous folks because of generational trauma and myself included, you had to work on healing the rift that you had with your own self. That was, that was the biggest, that was the toughest thing to do. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you just created this ministry where people were, they did okay for a while, then they didn't do okay, and then they're back again. And the church was always willing to throw them back in front and do ministry without ever dealing with what was really going on. Mm. To, to help people actually deal with what's going on inside without it. But I know that it's kind of, you can go too far. Like this wasn't the be all and end all. This was a thing that we're going through right now because of what had happened in the residential schools. It wasn't, it wasn't going to be this way. It's not going to be this way forever, but it was definitely something we had to build in these resources to work at. So then this meant seeing how the gospel story took in the recovery, recovery field. So then, so then when I, do training in communities, I, I kind of use the language games that they already have instead of trying to mm. re-teach them something new, which was my complaint with a lot of the programs that came out of, uh, there's lots of good programs, but because we they were so, uh, you know, you had to learn this whole new thing every time. I, I kind of enjoy, I like the, the kind of, that identifies things that are already there in the community and just helps us do more. The appreciative inquiry stuff was quite helpful. So I don't know if that makes any sense. No, I just I'd love to try trying to shift a little bit to to do what John has said to just say that look, this stuff is important that you're doing already. There's an essay I read years ago about the way that. The Canadian government, for example, does relief and development. They'll start a whole new program, hire all new people <laughs> and to institute this program. So then 80% of the money ends up being eaten by this new bureaucrat right. instead of just instead of just identifying the people in the community who are already doing this stuff and just empowering them to do to do that. Like there was this person in this essay said that's what they should be doing instead of creating these huge, well, Indian affairs or indigenous affairs, they call it now. That was an example. But, but we, tend to, Sorry, go ahead. we tend to do that too, I think. so. But that's been the ongoing criticism of, of the World Bank. The World Bank, yeah. same, same thing, right? There's so much of bureaucracy and a lot of the money gets eaten up by, by those anyway. 
it's been fascinating and I, we can go on forever, but we won't. <laughs> I'd like to kind of wrap things up now, but is there anything that came to mind that you said, shoot, I should have said that or I should have contributed in any last kind of because, um, advice? Because this will go to, this video will go to not just the school, it'll go to congregations, ministers, and who knows, it might even go out of Canada. I think it might. So, and because we're living in a, in a special time and place of churches languishing, for a bit, lack of a better word, right? They are neither flourishing nor dying. <laughs> they're in this in-between place in limbo. Is there anything that comes to mind that you would like to close with? And you don't have to. Rob, are you guys doing stuff with the whole creation, shifting everything to sort of think about how it flows out of creation rather than just talking and singing? And I was I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yes. I mean, yes and no. It's not completely through our whole curriculum, but there are aspects of our curriculum where we're trying to pay closer attention to that um, creation, care, climate crisis and also stewardship of the land because we have a nice piece of property on the water. So we're trying to talk about like our actual situatedness is right. part of our theological expression. It's not, um, we're not separate from that. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a slow process. Ray, I wouldn't say it's happening overnight, but it's a growing awareness and I hope a deepening, a deepening commitment. And Rob, I want to mention, uh, you and Raste were co-authoring a book uh, studying that studied thriving churches, which is due to come out in the fall, I think. So I would uh, like yeah, to thanks. put that up on the website at some <laughs> point of time. Thanks for the plug. I feel like I'm on a late show TV, late night <laughs> TV show now. <laughs> yeah, Russ Day, a colleague, and I have written a book called Turning Ourselves Inside Out. And the subtitle is Thriving Christian Communities. And it reflects on quite a few of the themes we've talked about here today. And it's, uh, it was a field-based study of thriving churches in Canada and the U.S. And uh, Fortress Press is printing it um, in late 2021. Right. So that I'd like to feature that on the uh, on our website and maybe interview and Russ later on for that. But for now, let's. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you uh, again yeah, so I much. Mean, my 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 parting thought, you know, I would sure. just say to folks, be of good courage. Like mm. the work. The work of the church's mission is always in the hands of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the Spirit will enact what she needs to enact. And uh, right. we get to be part of it. <laughs> right. We don't have to invent it all from scratch. Yeah. I have, uh, I have Oscar Romero's prayer above me, and he says, it helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. That's right. the first part of his plan. Right. I love that, right? It's not about us. We are, like you, you mentioned microcosm. We're in a very small part of creation history. And I think just to remind ourselves that it's the work of the Holy Spirit, not ours. Thanks. The thing is to be obedient and discern our place. <laughs>